starting in about a minute. Well, good afternoon. Uh, we will be starting our seminar in a moment. But before we do, those that are in the audience, please be aware of the exit signs in case we need uh, to leave the uh, room uh, and go to the main lobby. Uh, those that are on the internet uh, viewing this seminar, um, regarding the Q&A towards the end of the seminar, please send your questions in at first opportunity so that we can have time to get them ready for you and so we can have time to answer them too. So thank you for that. Thanks, Peter. Good afternoon and welcome uh, to our seminar. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker today, Dr. Debbie Burnett, uh, who will talk about the environment threat of low level pressure VOCs from consumer products using a modeling approach. Um, Dr. Bennett is a currently an uh, associate professor at the Department of Public Health Science in UC Davis. She received his, her PhD in mechanical engineering from UC Berkeley in 1999 and was an assistant professor at Harvard School of Public Health before joining the UCD faculty in 2005. Um, Dr. Bennett's research focuses on the fair transport and the exposure of particular matter and VOC compounds in multi-scale applications and in both the indoor and outdoor multi multimedia environments within the context of both environment ep epidemiology and environment risk assessment. She utilized both modeling and measurement techniques, bridging the gap between those two lines of inquiry her research interests also include development of methodologies to assess exposure in autism epidemiology studies and exposures to particular matter endotoxins and pesticides among farm works. She also conducts exposure studies focusing on flame retardants, hazardous air pollutants, and perfluorylated compounds. Um, the presentation Dr. Bennett is going to give today is based on the research results for the ARB funded research contract, which, which is part of efforts to better understand the potential impacts of LVP VOCs on air quality. Um, the presentation will describe the development and implementation of modeling tools for, pot for two potential modes of releases of low level pressure VOCs during the use of consumer products, including the direct release to the outdoor air and the deposed down, deposed down the drain. Uh, in order to evaluate the availability of those air with PL VOC compounds in the atmosphere, that might contribute towards ozone formation. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Bennett. Thank you for that nice introduction. I 
wanted to first acknowledge my co-investigators. Dr. Young Lu Shin is a postdoctoral fellow at UC Davis and was instrumental in conducting most of the work that, uh, that we will be presenting here today. I also wanted to acknowledge uh, Dr. Tom McCone, who is not joining us because he is currently in Denmark and is quite late there. Uh, he is from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and also the University of California at Berkeley. We had two primary objectives in this work. Overall, we were trying to develop and evaluate environmental modeling tools to determine, first, what portion of the low vapor pressure VOCs that are volatilized to the air during the use of a consumer product will remain in the indoor air and therefore able to potentially form ozone. Second, what portion of the low vapor pressure VOCs disposed of down the drain from consumer product use will then be emitted to the air from the wastewater treatment facility or from the uh, effluent stream and subsequently be available to potentially form ozone. Overall, there is, th this is a picture of how we get from consumer product use to potential to form ozone. I'm showing the entire process and then we'll discuss which processes are covered in this research and which are not. When a consumer product is used, a portion of it might be volatilized into the atmosphere and somehow get into the outdoor air. Also, a portion of it might be disposed of down the drain, depending on the use, so things like laundry detergent, dish soap, fabric softener, things like that that are, that are used in an environment where there is disposal down the drain. Um, we'll make it to the wastewater treatment plant. Once in the wastewater treatment plant, here we go, I'm not very good with this mouse, we have a wastewater treatment um, model, and there's two potential, thing, two potential ways the chemical can then get into the atmosphere. It can be directly emitted to the, I'm going to give up on the pointer, it can be directly emitted, into, volatilized into the atmosphere, as you see in the middle box on this slide. Once it's volatilized into the atmosphere, it needs to then go through an environmental fate and transport model to determine once released into the air, would it be available to form ozone in the air or does it go to another compartment? That portion that would react in the air is then moving into that box on the upper right-hand corner and would be potentially available for ozone formation. Following along the bottom of the slide, the chemical could leave the wastewater treatment plant intact and be discharged into the surface water. Once in the surface water, then that, surface, that can be an input into a multimedia environmental fate and transport model, and a portion of that chemical can volatilize from the surface water into the air where it has the potential to potentially initiate a reaction to form ozone. Looking at the top half of the graph of the figure, if a chemical is released into the atmosphere do, during consumer product use, we then need to ascertain what the fate and transport of that chemical is once released into the air. Does it stay in the air where it might form, where it might react and have the potential to form ozone, therefore putting it into that box in the upper right-hand corner? Or does it transfer to another environmental media where it might be degraded, or is it evicted downwind where we then need to think about the subsequent impact on the downwind airshed? Now, what we are doing in this particular project are the green arrows. So we are focusing on the green arrows. We are not looking at all at the red dotted arrows. So basically, how much of the chemical, what fraction of the chemical goes into the air versus what fraction of the chemical is disposed of down the drain during consumer product use. Um, so we're not, um, those are beyond the scope of this study. So that's what we're basically saying here on the first bullet on this slide, that we do not estimate the fraction that would make it to the outdoor. Um, we're assuming that the chemical already has made it to the outdoor. In order to determine what fraction makes it to the outdoor, one would need to develop several product-specific models that basically can determine you know, for a particular product type and different use patterns that the public would have, what might be the fate and trans, you know, the, the emissions from that product use. Um, and likewise, for determining the fraction of the chemical that would be disposed of down the drain. Also, we do not actually follow through in an atmospheric model to determine if the chemicals 
form ozone. What we are doing is what is the fraction that reaches outdoor air and has that initiation, initiating reaction with an OH radical? More complex atmospheric photochemical models, such as the US EPA community multi-scale air quality model, are needed to simulate how much ozone would be formed in the atmosphere. So we're just looking at what fraction is available um, in the air. A project was completed through a number of specific tasks. Our first task was to evaluate the existing wastewater emission models, select one, and then estimate the atmospheric availability of low vapor pressure VOCs disposed of down the drain. Second, we wanted to evaluate existing multimedia fate and transport models that are sim suitable for simulating low vapor pressure VOCs in an urban multimedia environment and select one for this effort. In terms of the outdoor multimedia fate and transport modeling, we also wanted to evaluate whether or not we needed to uh, use a, a dynamic model or whether a steady state model, which is much simpler, uh, would be sufficient. And also how much difference there is if you use a multi-box spatial model versus just a single box model. Once we had all of our models in place, they needed to be integrated because as you'll recall, the, um, the chemicals that are going through the wastewater treatment facility might be emitted to the air or they might be discharged into the stream. And then the multimedia fate and, model, fate and transport not, models need to be applied to those streams. And we also needed to provide the integrated model in a way that the ARB could use this in their future efforts. And then also to publish a paper on the findings. We evaluated the fate and transport of a total of 32 compounds and mixtures that was selected by ARB with input from stakeholders. We also looked at the EPA Chemical and Product Category Database, CPCAT. Um, it's got some information on chemical use of various different chemicals, and many of those selected compounds were found to be used in a variety of consumer products, including laundry detergents, fabric softeners, dishwashing detergents, and other types of laundry products. In this presentation, just so that it, uh, for clarity of presentation, sometimes we present the results from all 32 compounds, and sometimes we focus on the 23 compounds from the list that are high production volume compounds that are a single compound rather than a mixture. And so sometimes um, looking at results of sensitivity analyses and so forth, we focus on just those compounds. And um, if you'd like those results on the ones that are not included in this presentation, all results are concluded for all 32 compounds in the final report. Okay, so first, the wastewater treatment plant emission models. So basically within this, our goal is to understand for those compounds that enter the wastewater treatment plant, what, what is their ultimate fate? So once in a wastewater treatment facility, the primary removal processes are that they could be volatilized to air, which is highly dependent on their Henry's Law constant and whether or not it's likely to prefer being in the air or in the water. The biodegradation, so the biodegradation while it's in the water and going through the, uh, the wastewater treatment facility, which is primarily dependent on the biodegradation half-life. And absorption of, uh, to sludge. So those with a very high octanol water partition coefficient will be likely to be sorbed to sludge and removed from the wastewater treatment facility through that. If the compound is not removed by any of these processes, it is then removed from the wastewater treatment facility as part of the effluent leaving the facility. A typical modeling paradigm for a wastewater treatment plant includes three primary tanks. There's the primary settling tank, the aeration tank, and the secondary settling tank. Each of these have different rates for volatilization and aeration, um, different rates for sludge removal, and various different flows throughout the, tank, throughout the tanks. Um, so you can see the various different processes in this diagram. There are Various models available to look at wastewater treatment plants. There are sort of two primary approaches that have been taken over the years. 
The Nancum and Rittman model developed in 1987 was a conventional concentration-based uh, fate and transport model for wastewater treatment. Another model, Clark et al., developed in 1995, was a fugacity-based model with updates in the Seth model in 2008. There were other models that have been developed that are, that are refinements of these various different models, um, but basically they're, these are sort of the primary two overall models. Um, the extra features in the subsequent models include various different uh, removal mechanisms and different handling of compounds added to improve model predictions. Um, unfortunately, for some of the later updates to the Namkin and Rittenman model, there's not enough information in the, available in the papers describing those models to be able to replicate those, waddle, those models. So after looking at all of the different models and comparing the results, we selected the Clark et al. model because we thought it was more appropriate than the Namkin and Rittenman models for our study purposes, primarily because it included volatilization from all three of the tanks, whereas the um, Namkin and Rittman did, did only included removals from the aeration tank. And since volatilization was one of our key concerns, we wanted to make sure we were capturing all potential volatilization. So for our input parameters for our, our chemicals, we primarily relied on the US EPA EpiSuite database. The EpiSuite database has both measured and modeled values. We always selected the measured value when it was available, but sometimes there's not measured values available, and so we relied on modeled values. We did a comparison between the modeled and the measured values for the com compounds that had both modeled and measured values. And for many of them, this, their, the values were quite similar. There were some cases where there might be some, um, some differences in the value, but for the most part, it, it seemed reliable. The major parameters that we needed values for are the Henry's Law constant, so the air water partitioning, the octanol water partition coefficient, and the biodegradation half-life in wastewater. We need an overall biodegradation rate constant for each of the tanks, and that data is not specifically available, but can be derived based on the biodegradation half-life in wastewater and the composition of the biomass and the partitioning between the water and the solids. So basically, we're assuming that the biodegradation is only occurring in the portion of the chemical that's in the water phase. We need to know what portion is in that water phase and therefore available for biodegradation. That's one of the improvements that had been made to the models over the years because the original ones assumed biodegradation everywhere, but it was realized that that wasn't terribly realistic. I've broken the fate of the compounds from the wastewater treatment facilities into two slides. Um, here also is the, your opportunity to see the list of the chemicals that we included in the modeling effort. This first slide shows the glycols and the glycol ethers that we considered in the model. These compounds all have some of the um, lower KOW values of the compounds in our model set, and as such, they are have a significant fraction in the water phase, thus available for biodegradation. And so for all of these compounds, you know, additionally, because the biodegradation rate constants were on the same, were, were such that um, you know, based on the amount of time these chemicals spend in the wastewater treatment facility, 100% of the compounds were biodegradate, bi were biodegraded in the wastewater treatment facility, and thus none were, were volatilized and none were released into the effluent. Things got a little bit more interesting on the next slide, because I know a slide where every result is the same isn't the most exciting. Um, our next group of compounds, the ones that you see at the top, so I'm going to try again on this pointer. Um, these, these top four here are all hydrocarbon um, solvents, and if you look over here to the right, you see that roughly 5 to 6 percent of these are discharged to effluent. They have very high KOW values, and so the majority is, on, is, is green there, indicating that it's removed as sludge waste, with a small fraction going to biodegradation. And you can see also that we have a bit of volatilization to the air, so the ice 
Isoparaphenetic hydrocarbons have about 9% volatilizing to air, and the N tridecane uh, 2 chemicals down has a bit released to air. The block of compounds below the hydrocarbon solvents are the esters. And you can see there, there's a bit more variety in the results, with some having a significant fraction going to biodegradation and some being primarily removed through sl sludge waste, with a portion of most of them having a, a small discharge to effluent, with uh, texanol having here in the middle um, the one with the longest purple bar approximately one-third of the way down the screen, having the highest fraction removed as in the effluent of the wastewater treatment facility. Um, about two-thirds of the way down, the one with the long name, the 2,4-trimethyl-1,3-pentadiol um, compound, you see that one has the largest fraction volatilizing into the air from the wastewater treatment facility at 11%. And then below the esters, we have um, some other compounds with another hydrocarbon solvent down on the bottom row. The biodegradation half-life in wastewater is the most uncertain input parameter, input variable that we have for the sewage treatment um, processing among the various input parameters that we considered. Um, and so we were going to do a bit of sensitivity on that on the next slide. But overall, our finding was that loss by volatilization in a wastewater treatment plant is, is negligible um, for most of the compounds. Basically, these compounds, many of these low, low vapor pressure VOCs have Henry's Law constants that, that really make them prefer being in water. So once they've been disposed of down the drain, the great fraction of them remain in the water, and so they're, just, they're not volatilizing all that much into the air with the few, not few exceptions that I noted. If we look at the um, biodegradation half-life in wastewater, it's very roughly estimated. It's just 1, 10, or 30 are basically the inputs available um, from the EpiSuite software. And so we basically increased uh, the initially assigned half-lives by a factor of 10. And we really found that only those two compounds that we noted as having significant emissions to air that um, really had much of a change, where the, the volatilization fraction changed by 7 and 15 percent, respectively, based on, on increasing the change in the biodegradation half-life by a factor of 10. For the remaining compounds, basically, there was less than a 2 percent change in the portion of the compound volatilizing. And so even though this was very a very uncertain parameter, it's not, for many of these compounds, not particularly sensitive just because even changing it that much, it still doesn't, the volatilization still doesn't begin to compete as a pathway. Okay. So now we're moving on to looking at the multimedia fate and transport models. We primarily focused on two models for our initial evaluation. We focused on the Caltox model, which was actually developed for the state of California by Tom McCone, and it's a very mature model. It's been used in numerous applications. And then we also looked at the Foster model, which is a particular derivation of the, the sort of multimedia fate and transport models that have been proposed by Don McKay, because in that model, they specifically looked at the fraction of low vapor pressure uh, VOCs to the potential for forming ozone in uh, Canada. Many of the other models out there, multimedia fate and transport models out there, are very similar. They've, multimedia fate and transport modeling has undergone large model comparison activities, and so therefore they're considered fairly equivalent. So the first thing we did was we replicated the results of those selected two models. We compared the results to determine all of the model differences. We obtained our estimated key model parameters, and then we applied these models to the LVP VOCs that we uh, evaluated in this project. So as I said, the Caltox model is a mature and widely used multimedia fate and transport model with an extensive history of model evaluation exercises and case studies. The goal of a multimedia fate and transport model is to determine if the chemical 
stays within the compartment that it was originally released to, if it's chemically, physically, or biologically transformed within that compartment, or if it's transported to another compartment either by an advective process or a uh, diffusive process. On this slide, you can see the diagram for the two models. Um, there are some differences in the compartments included in the two models. On the right, you'll see that there is an urban film included in the Foster model that is not included in the Caltox model. And on the, the, on, on the Caltox model, you can see that there's deep soil and sediment included, which isn't particularly relevant for chemicals where you're worried about partitioning out of the air. But those are the differences in the model. You can see that they both have air and surface water and surface soil and, um, and so forth. So the models are similar in the fact that they're both fugacity based. They're both a level three multimedia partitioning model. And what level three means is that means it's basically a steady state model with an input specified to a particular compartment. A level one is you just assume everything's in equilibrium. A level two is basically kind of a steady state, but it, 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 with, but it doesn't specify the emission to where the emissions are to. But a level three, you have a specific emission into a compartment and then look at the steady state results based on that emission. And then a level four is a temporal variable model. These equations are always both based, these, these two models are both based on a series of coupled mass transfer equations. Um, and there's also some differences. As I said, there's some differences in the model compartments and the compartment dimensions. The most significant difference in terms of the compartment relative to this exercise is the lack of the urban film in the Caltox model. We looked in extensively into whether how much of a limitation this was because it does have the potential to remove the compound from the air and provide another removal process. Unfortunately, there's, there's just not very much data out there on reaction rates within the urban film. So, you know, even if you get into the urban film, that's fine, but then there's not good information on the degradation rates. It's not a well-studied media, and so it introduces a lot you know, it introduces uncertainty that can't really be um, resolved. In terms of the input parameters, as I noted, Caltox was developed for the state of California, and therefore the landscape parameters for that model are based on what we have here in California, whereas the Foster model was developed in Canada, and it basically represents southern central Canada. Um, and we'll discuss some of the differences between those in the upcoming slides. In terms of the fugacity capacity calculations, Caltox, when you're, when you're determining the fugacity capacity of a given compartment, if you think about soil, you have the soil particles themselves, you have uh, the water between the soil particles, and then you also have any water um, between the soil particles. So you have air, water, and, and, and soil. And the Foster model just considers the fugacity capacity of the soil particles themselves, whereas the Caltox model includes the fugacity capacity of the soil particle, the water, and the air. And this is important, especially if the chemical is heavily prefers to be in water, because then without that, without the presence of the water accounted for in the model, you might be missing a portion of the chemical that would likely to be found in the soil. Some of the key input parameters that are relevant for a multimedia transport model are the first order degradation rate in air. And so these basically are input as the reaction rate with OH radicals, and we consider this the first step towards forming ozone. And as I said, additional models would be needed to fully go through all of the various different processes and steps following that initial reaction to determine if ozone is actually formed. The advection loss rate from the air, so basically chemicals can leave the compartment, the, the box model, from air, and so the rate and transfer of that is important. And one of the things that we found to be critical um, was the rain events. Uh, basically, 
there are various different ways a compound can make it from the air to the ground. So if you have differences in the fugacity between the air and the ground, you can have transfers you're going through the boundary layer between the air and the soil, then transferring the chemical to the ground. Or you can have an advective process. The various advective processes would be deposition of particles from the air to the soil and rain. Basically, you know, as we all know, when it, after it rains, you, you get this beautiful clear sky because the rain you know, removes a lot of the particles. It removes any chemicals that are likely to be sorbing to water in that um, in that event. And as I mentioned when I was discussing the wastewater treatment facility and how we saw that you know, once these compounds are in the water, they tend to like to stay in the water. And so this has a really big influence on the overall fate and transport because if the chemical has the ability to attach to a raindrop, it's going to then move from the water to the soil. But if it doesn't have that ability to attach to a rain particle, doesn't necessarily have a way to get into the soil or any surface water. And so that is one of the big differences between doing modeling in California and a place like um, Canada, where you have much more frequent rain events um, throughout the year. Um, when I first moved to Boston, because I, I, as it was mentioned, I was on the faculty at Harvard for a while. I would complain incessantly about the weather in the summer. I pretty much just complained about the weather all the time. Um, <laughs> that's why I'm back. Um, and I would complain, I'm like, why is it raining in the summer? What is wrong with this? And, and people would, would say to me, they're like, what are you talking about? It obviously rains in California in the summer. You're just sitting here imagining that it doesn't rain in California in the summer. I'm like, no, 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 it actually doesn't rain in California <laughs> in the summer. Um, and so as you can see, Something like this that has a big influence on the fate and chemical, fate and transport of the chemical when you consider different landscape um, conditions is going to make a big difference. And so that's one of the big differences between California and Canada. We did a case study with the multimedia fate and transport model. We focused on the South Coast Air Basin, particularly because that is the area in California that struggle, one of the areas in California that really struggles with an extreme status in regard to ozone non-attainment. Um, the South Coast Air Basin is also, it's a perfect place to put a box model because it is surrounded by mountains and so you have a nice contained air shed and then there's basically a pathway through, through the mountains where you can get the chemicals following the purple arrow in the middle from the Los Angeles and Orange County regions into the San Bernardino and Riverside regions, which also suffer from ozone non-attainment. So you have more a heavier population density in Los Angeles and Orange County. You also, at this point, there's, there's quite a bit of people in the, that sort of close in Riverside, San Bernardino area, but it's really ideal for setting up a two-box airshed model, which was one of the things that we wanted to evaluate. So we ran the model for uh, daytime, so releasing the compound to the outdoor environment during the day. And on this first slide, as with the wastewater ones, I first show the glycol and glycol ethers on this slide. And you can see in the reaction, the reaction in air is the light blue on this slide. And you can see that between roughly 60% to 90% of the compound would remain in the air available for reaction um, with an OH radical. And then you can see that uh, all the way to the right, the sort of tannish color is advection out of the airshed into the next airshed. And so when you evect something into the next airshed, one needs to then consider what's going to happen in that airshed. And, and basically, that would be releasing it into another box where, once again, you would anticipate to see between 60 and 90 percent available for ozone reaction in that compartment. And again, a portion being evected further out over the desert where, in this case, the population does tend to go down as you move inland. You also see that in the green, it's a little hard to see the green, but basically um, those little green bars, there is some reaction in the soil 
generally between 1 and 3% is reacted in the soil. Again, on the next slide, we have our other compound groups with the chlorinated with the hydrocarbon solvents on the top, and then the esters, and then the other compounds. Um, again, similar results. Um, the dimethylglutarate having a, about a third of the way down, having 50% being invective, that, invective out, that's the largest fraction, invected. Um, the glycerol about two-thirds of the way down, having the largest portion reacted in soil. But basically, again, a large portion of what is volatilized during the air in use is going to remain in the air, available to form ozone, or be advected to the next um, compartment down. We wanted to think also about what was happening during the nighttime. And during the nighttime, basically, the... OH radical concentration is lowered by roughly three orders of magnitude. So you're basically shutting off that OH radical reaction rate in air. And as a result, what happens is you have a, a much greater portion advected into the downwind compartments. Again, you need to ask what will happen the next morning when it makes it into that downwind compartment. And you do see here shown in purple or lavender, a greater fraction of the compound reacted in soil because we, we saw before that was on the order of sort of 1% to 3%. Now it picks up to be a greater proportion um, during the night. There is a little bit of loss there. Um, here are the results looking at the continuous rainfall scenario. So this would basically be if instead of assuming, basically the results I've shown up until this point have assumed no rain. So basically it's, it's summertime in Southern California. We shut that transfer pathway off. If we allow that transfer pathway to occur, so here basically think Seattle, slight drizzle all the time, continually moving the compound. There we get much more compound degrading in water because it has a way to get there. And so there you see about half of the compound degrading in water. You have, see a, a significant fraction degrading in soil, again, because it has a way to get there, with some of the compounds still be, remaining um, for reaction in air there on the blue bars. But you get a very different um, picture whether you have or, or do not have rain in your region. We did an uncertainty analysis looking at the percent contribution of the various model inputs to the output uncertainty, the reaction half-life in air, as you might imagine. And again, this is, this is done for the daytime. The reaction half-life in air has the um, greatest contribution to the uncertainty in the percent available for ozone reaction. Um, the wind speed also was influential in some of the compounds with all other compounds, or all other inputs, um, no other input had more than a 10% contribution to the uncertainty, and there's just sort of lumped together there in the blue on the right. So during the daytime, both models, both, um, when, when the, mo the other thing I should specify is that when we were first investigating the differences between the Caltox model and the Foster model, we were getting, you know, we just ran them as they were set up, and we got wildly different results between um, the two of them, in part just because California, just the general California model, has very little water, very little rain compared to Canada. And so we were getting different models, and we realized, oh, wait, this is the way the parameters are, are, um, are different between the two regions being modeled. And so we also ran both models parameterized the same way. So, you know, shutting off rain, turning on rain, changing the fraction of water. And basically, you, you got very similar results from the two models when they were parameterized in the same way. Um, during the nighttime, your loss by reaction in air with OH radicals is greatly reduced because there is a very small OH radical concentration during the night. And your loss by reaction in other compartments, such as soil, vegetation, and in the Foster model, the urban surface film is negligible for most compounds. And from the Monte Carlo uncertainty analysis, we found that wind speed, reaction half-life, and air were the two most influential parameters on the overall fraction available. 
The Foster model is also available in a level four dynamic model. And we ran it with the dynamic conditions, looking at the concentration changes over the entire period and found that they were within two to three of the mean concentrations. And so we felt that, um, you know, it, it, it was sufficient and much simpler for future use to leave the model in a level three version. Also, looking at the two box model, uh, there was a, a um, lo looking at the two boxes coupled together and considering them coupled together, um, we felt basically you ended up with basically the same results for those compounds. And so in a situation where you have two models side by side, you really it's not necessary to, to run it as a two box model because the, the outputs are basically the same. We were also asked to run the model for some VOCs as well. And so both models were run for six VOCs recommended by uh, Air Resources Board listed below on the top bullet. Um, for the acetone, ethyl acetate, and methyl ether ketone, the half-lives of these compounds in air were far greater than the half-lives for the LVP VOCs that we evaluated. And so a much greater fraction of these compounds were advected from air rather than reacted in air um, because um, that just ended up being the dominant pathway with the longer half-lives. And so these results found that um, the, the wind speed was a, a much greater, um, it, it, it was much more important for these and that reaction was less significant for these. But again, they would then be available for reaction in future compounds. As I indicated, the, these results that we ran are very specific to regions where there is little water and little rain. Because these compounds have small Henry value, Henry's law constants, um, the model is very sensitive to the precipitation rate and also to the fraction of the surface area that is water. And so Southern California is hot and dry in the summer and doesn't necessarily have very much surface water. And therefore, you know, a, a, a vast majority of California is similar in this regard. There are regions of California where there is rain, but a, a significant portion of California has a long, hot, dry summer with little surface water. And incidentally, the majority of the population lives in these areas that tend to be drier. The, the northern parts of our country and the, the Sierras over in the eastern part where we see more precipitation and more water tend to be more sparsely populated. So we feel that there's some degree of applicability to the Southern California results for the population of California. However, we do note that these results are really not um, applicable to areas of the U.S. where you see frequent summertime rainstorms. Okay, so once we were happy, we'd evaluated our models, we understood what was going on in them, then we needed to do our model integration activity. And so as stated on the first slide, uh, once something goes into the wastewater treatment facility, there's really three options. It can either be removed in the wastewater treatment facility treatment facility by biodegradation or sludge removal. A portion of it can be volatilized. Once volatilized, as I noted, it then needs to go into the multimedia fit and transport model. And a portion is also discharged into the effluent of the, from the wastewater treatment facility, where again, that needs to be input into a multimedia model. Not input into the air compartment, as we've been focusing on, but input into a surface water compartment. So. We basically, of the original 32 compounds that we focused on, 10 of them have some discharge going into the surface water. And the distribution of the compound in between the different environmental compartments uh, is based on the chemical properties. For those with the highest KOW uh, values, the majority of the compound partitions to the sediment. For the most part, the ones that do leave the wastewater treatment facility are the ones with those high KOW values. The Texanol has a mid-range mid KOW, and there you see that it tends to be more in the surface water than the sediment. What's discharged from the plant, that's that long blue bar. 
And there's a tiny, tiny 0.03% that will be distributed into the air of the 224 trimethyl uh, 1,3 pentadiol. You can't really see it, but it's there. So we have a, a small fraction of that compound going into the air. In, char- in terms of then where those are, uh, how those are then removed from the atmosphere, most of the, re- the removal is through degradation in the surface water with a small portion um, reacting in air or surface water. So now looking at the whole thing overall, so considering what's volatilizing directly into the air and what's going out the effluent and applying the various um, models as appropriate, we see again for the glycols and the glycol ethers that basically 100% is biodegrad- biodegraded in the wastewater treatment plant. Um, a tiny bit of the one um, isn't, but for the most part, it's mainly um, biodegraded in the treatment plant. And then looking at our other compound classes, here we have a little bit more variety in our answers. We have some being biodegraded. In, Having undergoing biodegradation, we have some removed with the sludge waste. We have some being degraded in the uh, water as it's leaving. And we do have a portion advected or reacted in air. The portion reacted in air is indicated with the number that you see. So if you recall, the isoparaphanetic hydrocarbons had 9% of the compound leaving the wastewater treatment facility and going into the air, but here you see that it's 7% because we've now applied the multimedia fate and transport model, and so 2% is in the little purple bar to the right of the green bar where it's being, react, where it's being evicted to a downwind compartment where it will likely undergo um, reaction in that compartment. So you now see that the numbers don't match exactly what was volatilized. They're slightly lower. Uh, Also, about uh, midway down, you see 9% for one of the compounds. But, I mean, for the most part, very little once you release it into the wastewater treatment facility is available for reaction. It primarily is removed um, through another mechanism. We provided an integrated model to the ARB. It's basically a series of Excel uh, uh, worksheets And basically, it's all combined into one workbook, where the first sheet has the instructions on how to use each sheet, each spreadsheet, and the general instructions. The second spreadsheet contains all the chemical properties that are used to run both the wastewater and Caltox models. The third sheet is the wastewater treatment uh, plant fate and transport model. Uh, The fourth one is the Caltox model assuming a release into air. The... um, Next sheet is the Caltox water, so that is the Caltox model assuming a release into surface water. And then finally, the last page presents the integrated model results for the fate of of down-the-drain compounds. And so that has been provided. Flipping back to the first slide that I showed um, early, or the third slide that I showed in this presentation, we look at the overall framework again. Following along the top, if a compound is released, is volatilized to the atmosphere during the use phase, we see that 41 to 94 percent during the daytime will react in that initial compound and be available to form ozone. We see that um, if you include volatilization or advection into the next compartment, that's more like 60 to 90 percent. If you follow along the bottom, this is for the 23 compounds. You see very little is is available for forming ozone. If you look at all 32, basically up to 11% might be volatilized with up to 8% available to form um, ozone and the remainder being advective. But for the majority of them, there's very little that is going to um, go into the atmosphere and be available for forming ozone. The big remaining question is, what happens when we use a consumer product? What goes down the drain and what's released into the air? Because that's really, when you have such differences in your model results between the two potential pathways, the focus really needs to turn now to the use models to understand when we're using a product, where is it going? 
And also, since every consumer use is going to have a different portion going to the air versus down the drain, we also need to come to uh, get an understanding of what fraction of chemicals used in a particular air shed are used in each of the various different categories of consumer products. So those are really the big outstanding questions from this. Um, the limitations, as I said, um, we, we, have, um, we don't necessarily have directly measured OH radical reaction rates. Uh, many times they're estimated. We don't know what fraction is estimated to be emitted into the air versus um, going down the drain. And, and when I say emitted to air, you know, it might be used indoors. We're assuming it's made it to the outdoor air. Um, and then we're assuming that that is evenly distributed through the air shed. There could be processes that we do not consider in these models that are not included in typical multimedia or wastewater models. And we don't really have any data available to do any comparison with real world scenarios because, we, because of the fact that we don't have a good understanding of that initial step of what fraction is emitted into the air during the use and what fraction goes into the wastewater and how much of, of the chemical is used overall. So that makes it very difficult to then in turn be able to take measured data and, and compare it to model results because we don't have the model inputs to model what's going on in a true airshed. So I think I'll leave it on this slide while I happily take any of your questions. Um, I'm curious about the assumptions for the wastewater treatment plant. So are both models are, uh, assuming that biodegradation happens in the water phase, not on the solid uh, phase, not on the portion that's uh, absorbed on the solid Yes. I, basically, wastewater treatment models have sort of evolved over time, and the current thinking is that the biodegradation only occurs for the portion in the water, partition to the water phase. And so we've parameterized the model that way. So um, then consequently, my question is, what happens to what is uh, absorbed on the sludge? I mean, if it doesn't biodegrade, what happens to it? You know, I mean, basically, when you remove sludge from the wastewater treatment facility, um, you know, it's, it's, it's somewhat contained, um, and there can continue to be biodegradation in the sludge in that. There is some degree of water. And these compounds, once they're not in air, they don't readily want to go to air. So, I mean, that could be something that we're, we're missing, but we really don't think that a significant portion would be volatilized out of the sludge um, because it's generally, you know, heaped together for a considerable amount of times without ready access to air. And also, it's generally kept somewhat moist, and so it would be more likely to want to stay in the sludge, would be my thought. Have another question? Yes. For the um, box models, um, I'm curious about how are they treating the distribution of uh, VOCs or LVP VOCs in particular? Are we assuming that we have a homogeneous three dimensional um, space and the densities and patients are uniform? Yeah, the typical assumption in the box modeling is that there is an atmospheric mixing height generally associated uh, with the atmosphere, and things are well mixed below the atmospheric mixing height because we have wind uh, distributing it, there's dispersion, um, and so then the atmospheric mixing height is generally selected to be typical for the region that is being modeled, and the chemical is assumed to be well mixed. Um, you know, there's, there's really not, I am not aware of any data that's really sh 
works to disprove that sort of assumption that we make, but we do make that, that is the typical assumption in a multimedia fate and transport model. No, uh, if no further questions. Yeah. Okay, yeah, um, <laughs> if no further questions, um, let's thank Dr. Bennett again for a great presentation. And also, <laughs> thanks to all the audience, uh, including the uh, people on the web level, for your attention. Thanks very much. Bye.